probably going to take a minute or two to introduce our first speaker because I have actually quite a long history with him and because um, he's the only business guy, I put that in quotation, who's going to be talking at the conference. And uh, I've, I've touched on this before. I've, I've found it interesting in the past that uh, uh, when we have uh, an architect or or an animator or a writer or a musician who comes up here and gives us a little taste of uh, their work in progress, talk about their lives, about uh, what they're uh, dreaming about, well, we're enchanted. Uh, but when a businessman comes up and really talks about the same things, his life, his dreams, uh, we, we tend to be judgmental about that. and The audience has not been even-handed. Uh, have roundly condemned previous speakers for being crass and commercial. And uh, I don't agree with that. I, I, I think there are business guys out there who have the same validity and uh, who approach their work with the same artistry. So I decided to book Harry Stinson because he and I actually have a long history. And if you haven't seen it already, I, I, I bring it out to you. This is an ad from yesterday's paper, but they're in every day's paper. Uh, wow safe money these days gets a miserable one or two percent or if you're feeling a little more extravagant take a bit of a risk you might get four or five here's harry day in day out in one of the most systematic ad campaigns i've ever seen offering 15 percent uh, because he's uh, dreaming big and uh, building big um, he's currently engaged in an interesting competition there's this guy donald trump who's uh, apparently well-known in the United States. Um, and uh, Harry is uh, competing with Donald by building uh, both the slimmest and uh, the tallest residential towers in Canada. Uh, but here's the difference. Uh, Harry's never had a penny from a bank. Uh, he seems to fund it either this way or through other ways mysterious he might tell us about. But he says that his building at uh, 1 King Street West is 96% sold out, and uh, Donald's big fat announcement hasn't even put a shovel in the ground. So, Harry, come up here, tell us how you do it, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good morning. There's an interesting piece in the paper yesterday, actually. Um, these uh, pieces on Live 8 and where all the concerts are going to be around the world. And they were talking about where the, uh, the others are, and in London is Hyde Park, and uh, France is Versailles, and Berlin is the Brandenburg Gate, and uh, Rome is the Circus Maximus, and uh, Canada is in Park Place in Berry. And the article said, pointedly noted, that Canada has no such famous landmarks to provide a backdrop. And that's a shame, because buildings really are an amazing part of our civilization and culture. And um, for, where is the little clicker here? Ah, here we are. Well, Disney World, you know, <laughs> you look at that and you know where it is. You look at many most buildings in Toronto, and you, know, you could be in Pittsburgh, you could be in Cleveland, you could be in, in Cape Town, you could be anywhere. But everybody knows Disney World. Kids know Disney World. It's, it's, it's become an icon, and all it's a building. Mind you, it's, it's not even the proper scale. They built those so that they look bigger than they are. They're three-quarter scale, and the taller stories are slightly smaller and slightly smaller and slightly smaller. So when you look at it, it appears far bigger than it actually is because the scale of the building is all designed that way to fool the eye. Habitat in Montreal. Now, if this had not been built as part of Expo, it would not be built. Trust me. No banker would ever finance this. But it's a fascinating space. Every one of them with their own little parks and gardens and streets wandering through it. Habitat in Toronto would sell out instantly. And in Montreal, it's still a very popular place to live. But it was built as a fantasy. And after Safdie built it, he could never get in, in Canada a lot of support for buildings like that. Ended up going off around the world, which unfortunately, the story of most Canadians who, who become inspired and creative and passionate about doing things is they end up becoming Canadian-born, so-and-so. <laughs> the City Hall in Toronto, if we have a building that is Toronto, it's City Hall. And it's a beautiful building, and it lost the architecture competition. They had this panel of experts, and they chose a different building. And there was a public outcry saying this was a better building, so all right, fine, well, we'll build it better. 
the passion we have in Toronto for things is disappointing. <laughs> There's one thing about Canadians that they are now, the only thing that Canadians are passionate about is their dislike of passionate people. I mean, you go into a bank and get excited about something and say they all leave the room. It's, it's, it's scary. <laughs> Thank you, son. We'll call. <laughs> Candy factory lofts. That was the first sort of huge gamble I took in building buildings. The candy factory was the first major loft building in the city. And it came about because I was selling real estate at the time. I was a real estate broker and schlepping around showing people houses. And it amazed me how many times I would get a phone call from a qualified, what I call it, a qualified buyer. I mean, they had serious money and they wanted something special, a lot like it's seen in the movies, something you know, that was different in terms of space. And we didn't have any. And I wasn't, as an agent, I didn't, um, I sold a lot of apartments, but I get tired of it eventually because I got frustrated with the product. So I thought, well, if I can find a, a builder who will build these lofts, then I can sell lots of them because there's a huge market out there for it. So I went to builder after builder saying, you've got to build these lofts. It, 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 people will buy them, half a million, million dollars. I said, look, son, we don't need, I get this son thing all the time. People who are half my age say, look, son, you know, it just <laughs> <laughs> drives me nuts. But they would say, well, why, why should we build these? We're pumping out these conventional condos and you know people buy them they pay for them and they pay silly prices so you know now your life's good I play golf at four o'clock why you know why should I go and do anything you know that's a little risky so I figured this this isn't gonna work I have to do it myself so I went out and got involved in the partnership to do the candy factory lofts and there it is and you know just to take that final analogy a little further in my rambling speech because that's what it says you're supposed to do here is I would go to the banks to try and finance this and say, you know, I have this project, it's sold. 101 out of 120 of the units are sold, which, you know, satisfies the benchmark. It's costed, we've got the building, got the zoning, I've got all the hard work on it here. It's ready to go. What do you think? I said, well, son, we have, <laughs> that they, we have experts. And they tell us that there's no market for lofts. Statistically, we've seen, we've checked that there's no precedent for lofts. So, you know, go away because our experts tell us that nobody will buy these. Said, Don't worry about it. There's, there's millions of dollars in the trust account. Here are the purchase agreements. People have bought them. No, no, you're not listening. Our experts have told us that there is no market for lofts. Therefore, we can't finance this building. But, you know, so there you go again. And it hasn't changed. This is One King West in 1914 when it was built. And it was at that stage the tallest building in the city. Now, a year later, the Royal Bank built 8 King Street East, which was then the tallest building in the city by about a story. So things haven't changed very much. They've, there's always another bank doing the tallest building. But this was the tallest building at the time. And it was the Dominion Bank. And they basically had a grand banking hall on the ground floor and their head office on the top floor. But that was the whole bank. There was no, there was no rest of the bank. The, the middle was just rented out office space. So this is it now. This is One King West now. The world's slanderous building, technically. It's 51 stories tall and 29 and a half feet wide at the base. And the tower is freestanding because the, the old building beside it is a ceramic building on the outside. And if we tied the, the tower, which really is a slender sail, to the old building, it would crack the outside of the old building. So it's freestanding. It goes right down to bedrock. It's anchored into the ground with a whole series of what are called micro piles where you, you drill into the ground and there's well, hundreds of, of, of little holes that you then wire. It, it's like a big hair weave, sort of the Mel Aspen school of, of, of <laughs> foundation. <laughs> and in the base, it's screwed into the bedrock. And we have big tanks in the top like a freighter. You go up on the top and there are these big hatches open and there are tanks of water in the top. And the theory is, and it's a theory because there's all these academics telling us how it will work, is that when the building sways, because it will, it's very tall and slender, although it's very heavy, it will sway slightly. The water moves with the building. When the building wants to sway back, the water keeps moving. So it counteracts the sway and slows it down. And inside those tanks, there are a series of bulkheads, and you can open and close the aperture to affect the speed of the water moving back and forth, which slows down the sway of the building. That's the theory, anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> it does work, though, because there is a certain amount of sway in the buildings. Not on the concrete building as much, and this is an incredibly heavy concrete building. This is looking at it from the base. 
So this part here, that was all supposed to be mirrored glass straight up, so it was like a knife rising up. I thought that would have been so cool. So if we can find the money for it, we'll put it back in. I just want to prove the point. That's looking at it from the, uh, from the west at 11 King. It's a really amazing shape. This is, the in, this is the boardroom. This is a real room. We're restoring this. And so fortunately, this is a picture from 1912. When you walk into this room, in a few months, it will be exactly like that. Not black and white, of course. But we've got the old furniture back. You know, it will be exactly restored to the way it was, the original boardroom of the Toronto Dominion Bank. This is the vault in the basement. That's the vault lady. We, she actually came in to an open house we had recently and introduced herself, told us all about, but this was the 1950s. This is the main vault downstairs where the silver was kept, and that's going to be turned into a dining room. It is a white marble floor in there. It's, it, it is, it's a really amazing room. And we actually put wireless technology inside it, so you can, no cell phones, so that'll be the best part. Okay, and this is Sapphire Tower, which is going to be 90 stories because Tom went a little bit taller, so we had to go a little bit taller. And uh, this will sit across from City Hall uh, in a little parking lot behind the old high steakhouse at 66 Temperance Street. And the globe at the top is where the sway damper is in this case. It'll be a mechanical sway damper. And the round cylinder is where the, most of the suites are. Then there's a little terraced area you can see at the 50th floor. But it's quite a fascinating shape. I think there's something like 30 different banks of elevators in it just to move people around. The design of the building is, it is, is fascinating. It is a condo hotel. It will have all sorts of different operations inside it. But just building iconic buildings that are different is a big part of the marketing. Buildings last a long time. You know, when I was a real estate agent running around, I thought, well, yeah, I'm really doing quite well. I've you know, got a profile in the brokerage community and so on. But, you know, if I were to hit by a bus, get hit by a bus, like, who cares? Another real estate agent will come along. There's nothing left. That's the nice thing about buildings. They last and they last and they last. Some of them last 5,000 years. But if you build something that's truly a magnificent building, it's a piece of art. Toronto is an Indian word meaning too many meetings. <laughs> and it's true. You know, like we don't, we have meetings. We're still having meetings on the waterfront. 90 years of meetings on developing the Toronto waterfront. It's absolutely absurd. I suggested to Miller that they have a competition and they give away the land on the waterfront. Give it away free, because right now nobody wants to pay for it anyways and nobody wants to buy it. So just have a competition and say we divide the waterfront up into 20 parcels of land. And the people that get it will be the people that propose the most interesting building and what they're going to do for the city. But it's free. You have to clean it up. You have to put transit down there. But it's free and have this international competition. People would flock to it from around the world. We have a fabulous waterfront. But you know what will happen? Then I'll set up a committee to organize it. <laughs> and it won't get done. Beware of the suits. Beware of the suits. <laughs> They'll tell you that it's unreasonable. Don't worry. You can't do it. You've got to be realistic. We won't finance you. And the, the, just the moral of the story, aim ready, fire, get your aim, then start going, then work it out, and keep working out and keep working out, because that's how business works. Right. Yep. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>